Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Steve Weberg. I'm with the uh, Public Affairs uh, staff of the Kansas City Public Library, and I want to thank you all for, for being with us uh, this evening. All, all of you here and, and those of us who are uh, watching via live stream. Um, just one quick reminder before we start tonight um, that we have a special occasion coming up uh, on, uh, on December 5th. Uh, those of you who don't know, when we mark the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Kansas City Public Library in, uh, in 1873. So, thank you. I didn't have anything to do with the first 140 years of that, just to make it clear. Um, but we're planning a, a full year of special events, uh, remembrances, other activities that will go run through 2024. And, and we're really looking forward to having you all join us in that celebration. Uh, tonight's also a bit of a celebration because we're partnering again with the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, uh, whom, as you all know, are, are you know, our longest and I think most cherished uh, partners in library programming. And on this occasion, it's for the, uh, for the third installment in our Conflict and Crisis series uh, that looks into the United States' main antagonist today across the globe. We're focusing tonight on our challenging relationship with Iran with the help of a panel of experts who are extraordinarily steeped on the subject. Uh, you'll remember that we started with, with Russia back in February, and, and that was the, uh, the one-year anniversary of its, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we spotlighted China in May. Uh, we'll look uh, into perhaps the world's most inscrutable nation, North Korea, in November. And then finally in February, Brian Steed, uh, who's one of our panelists tonight, returns to talk about the world's violent extremist organizations. Brian, of course, is a, uh, is a popular, is a familiar and popular presence here at the library. This is his 12th speaking appearance, uh, going back to 1994. Um, he's taught at the Command and General Staff College since 2013. He's an associate professor of military history there, and he's an internationally acclaimed and very much sought after speaker on a number of subjects, including all things Middle East. Uh, he's a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, uh, served as a Middle East foreign officer, lived and worked there for eight and a half years uh, as an officer in the Jordanian Army, as a liaison to the Israel Defense Forces, and as an advisor and analyst in Iraq. He's written or edited nine books, the latest of which just came out in March. Wrote it with his wife, uh, Sherry, Voices of the Afghanistan War, Contemporary Accounts of Daily Life. And I think Brian's 13th or 14th appearance at the library would be to talk about that book. Uh, with him are two eminent co-panelists, Gates Brown in the middle, is also an associate professor in the Command and General Staff College's uh, Department of Military History and was the college's Civilian Educator of the Year in 2021. He's a former Army captain. He served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and was injured in combat uh, when an uh, improvised explosive device detonated beneath the vehicle in, in which he was riding. He, he briefly taught after that at the Command and General Staff College, and then attended graduate school at the University of Kansas through the Wounded Warrior Education Initiative, and he earned master's, and, master's degree and a doctorate in military history, and returned to the Command and General Staff College to teach in 2015. And finally, Colonel Frank Clemus just wrapped up this month, right? Yep. Uh, more than 24 years as a U.S. Air Force officer, uh, culminating in his command of the Air Force's 505th Command and Control Wing, Detachment 1, at Fort Leavenworth. Before that, he spent three years at the Command and General Staff College as Chief of Joint Integration and as an Assistant Professor in its Department of Joint 
interagency and multinational operations. Frank was a, also like Brian, a, a foreign area officer for the Middle East and in North Africa. And among his many commendations over his career is the uh, Defense Meritorious Service Medal, awarded for, quote, non-combat meritorious achievement or service that is incontestably exceptional and of magnitude that clearly places the individual above his peers. Before the Air Force, Colonel Klamis served seven years at sea and ashore in the U.S. Coast Guard. So he has a long, long public service record. As always tonight, we'll leave time at the end of our program for Q&A. Uh, we actually have microphones. Microphones will be placed here on this side and right over in this direction. Um, we'll ask everyone to use those microphones so that everyone, not only here, but at home uh, on uh, live stream can hear the questions. Um, and then viewers at home can submit their questions starting right now, all through the program and afterwards, anytime uh, via the YouTube chat box. So now would you please join me in welcoming Brian Steed, Gates Brown, and Colonel Frank, Frank Clemus to the library. Okay, so I'm going to start tonight with a little, oh, uh, well, it's not really a war story, but kind of like that. So in 2005, when I was doing my training for a foreign area officer, I visited Bahrain. And while there, I was meeting with an embassy uh, political officer, and he shared with uh, me and the officer I was with uh, an insight that he gained from one of the Bahrainian officials with whom he engaged regularly. And that Bahrainian official said that when America thinks about Iran, they think about the Islamic Republic of Iran. And when uh, the people in the region think about Iran, they think about the Persian Empire. And so I want to reintroduce everyone tonight to the Persian Empire very, very briefly. OK, so when we think about it, uh, this is the empire that you know, even if you don't know it by this name, because this is the one that fought the Greeks, you know, so the movie 300 or the, uh, the book 300 is kind of a comic book. Anyway, and that, that's this empire. It's the empire uh, that sends the Jews back to Israel to build, to rebuild the temple. So that's this Persian empire the uh, Achaemenid Persian Empire. And they are defeated by Alexander the Great. Okay, And then they get replaced after Alexander's successors uh, get defeated by the Parthian Empire. And for those of you who know ancient history, this is the one that the Romans fight. So when the Romans are fighting Persia, they're fighting the Parthians. And they will get defeated by these guys, the Sasanian Persians. These are often the ones that nobody ever pays attention to because nobody actually studies this history uh, unless you're kind of focused on the area. And these are the guys who will be in existence when Islam comes out of the Arabian Peninsula. And so they will be defeated by the Muslims uh, at several critical battles and ultimately they will be uh, destroyed by what will become uh, the Rashidun caliphate uh, coming out of Arabia. And for a while, they actually control Jerusalem, and, uh, and they're quite successful. We should know more about them, but we kind of don't because we don't talk about them too much. Okay, and then this is after the caliphate start to sort of fall apart, we'll get a Persian empire that will come again, and that's the Safavid empire. Now, when I was an undergraduate doing uh, Middle East history, uh, I promised myself, because there were just so many different rulers and groups and dynasties, that I wouldn't remember any of them that ended in ID. And so the Safavids just sort of fell off. You know, Parthians, that doesn't end in ID, and I remember that, and Sasanians, not in ID, so I was okay there. But the Safavids, I just sort of ignored until 
2015 when I was watching ISIS videos uh, and reading ISIS propaganda. And the ISIS guys would refer to the Iraqi security forces as Safawis. And I'd never heard that term before. And so I broke out my Hans Veer uh, Arab English dictionary, if you're familiar with it. Uh, Frank is. And I was going through the dictionary looking for what Safawi means. And what Safawi means is Safavid. And so the ISIS guys referred to the Iraqi security forces as Safavids. And I'm like, OK, well, I need to understand uh, this is the ID guys that I didn't pay attention to. And now I had to dive back into them. What is important for Iran, OK, and I use the air quotes because, of course, it's Persia at this point, is when the Safavids start in 1500, there is no, um, well, Shia Islam in, in Iran is a minority religion in 1500. In fact, it's like fewer or smaller than 10% of the population are Shia. Okay, by the time the Safavids are done in 1736, it'll be 90 plus percent will be Shia. Okay, so they changed that. And it's not just Shia, they are Twelver Shia, which is a particular type. And when the Safavids start, Twelver Shiism is, I don't know, technically, whether it's the smallest, but it's one of the smallest subsects of Shiism. But by the time the Safavids are done, it is the largest sect of Shiism. And before, where it had been significant was in southern Lebanon. And that's where it was sort of, that's where the Twelvers kind of hung out. And that was kind of it. There were a few other places, but that was the big concentration. But then the Safavids came and turned Persia into Twelver Shia. And that's a huge element that's going to come back as we talk about this. And the Safavids don't really have a grand story for how they, like they weren't defeated in a big battle or anything like that. They sort of just fall apart. And then there's a series of dynasties that come in. And where I, when I hand it off to Gates, it's going to pick up with this one at the bottom, the Pahlavi dynasty, which those of you guys who are familiar with Iran will recognize, you know, Reza Shah Pahlavi, like that's his family. Okay, so they show up there at the end. Now, if you po Pay attention, like, unfortunately, these are not perfect because they're not all the same scale. Kind of wish they were. But notice how big the Persian Empire is in each case. Okay, this is massive. And this is still pretty big. And, oops, it's double tapping. And this one goes all the way in. If you notice at the bottom, uh, you see, or I'm sorry, at the far right, you see Kandahar. So it goes all the way into Afghanistan. It includes a lot. So it's quite big. And it's important to remember this as I bring up some key points. OK, so Steve introduced this series. And the reason we kind of went this series the way we do, the US military tends to talk about American opponents as four plus one. OK, so that's Russia, China, uh, North Korea, Iran. That's the four. And then the plus one are violent extremist organizations. So. The Iranians are like a polite dinner guest. They always come with a plus one, OK? <laughs> always. And really, in many cases, it's a plus. In, in Syria, for example, they're a plus 39. In Iraq, they're a plus 40. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, hopefully none tonight, because we're going to talk about this in February. But I just want to emphasize this aspect about how Iran does business in terms of its imperial interests. And so this is a very busy slide to get, like these are all the places that they're doing things and have done things over the last 20 years or so, OK? So they're kind of everywhere. And, but why are they everywhere? And I want to get back to this final point. I'm skipping two slides at a time. OK. Um, so first of all, Iran thinks and acts like it's an empire. So I want you to keep that in mind. If you think about all the major empires in the world, not well, maybe not all. That's an overstatement. But most of them, they kind of have one thing in common. They are not only members of the empire club, but they're also double members of the nuclear club. So if you're a big empire, you kind of want to have a nuclear weapon. And so 
that's acting like an empire. So it shouldn't shock any of us that they're pursuing what every other major empire has. Uh, the other part is that religion matters. Like, it's serious. A lot of times uh, in Western Europe and America, to a degree, we think religion's not very important because we have very secular capitals. Religion shapes how they do business and how they perceive the world and interpret the world. Um, and religious engagement is one of Iran's primary tools. That's just an important rule to think about. Uh, at this moment, right now, they control in either directly or indirectly every major Shia shrine in the world because they now have influence in Iraq and other places through the various militia groups that they control. Or uh, control is too strong. Anyway, but they influence. We'll use it that way. Okay, and then the other point is Iran is opportunistic. I was just going to put ROI, but I wanted to make sure it was clear. It's return on investment. Like they are big penny stock guys. So they'll, they'll, they look for penny stock opportunities and they'll invest there because they think they can get a huge return on investment. So a lot of their behaviors are this big ROI stuff. Uh, so keep that in mind as we talk about this. And then the other part, when we're talking about the plus one, the IRGC and the Quds Force, those are the guys who train and interact with that plus one around the world, wherever they are. Okay, so those are the, the big picture comments. They're an empire, they think like an empire. But now we're gonna talk about the U.S. relationships with it, and I'm gonna turn it over to Gates. Thank you, I'll try to be short. Brian threatened revolutionary consequences if I went over my allotted time, so. We have two pictures, the one on the right, black and white, Mohammed Mossadegh, and he represents kind of a potential path for Iran in the post-World War II era. And the one on the right is the Shah of Iran from 1941 to 1979. The path that Iran chooses is also chosen for Iran. What we're gonna talk about is how do we get from this potential to the reality. Mohammed Mossadegh comes to power in the early 1950s, and one of the things he wants to do is make Iran work more for Iranians. There's a lot of baggage, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's kind of the bumper sticker. And so he starts off trying to get the British to let the Iranians audit their books, because the British have an oil concession that's very profitable. It's also exploitative. And what Mossadegh wants to do is just make sure that the Britons are abiding by their contractual obligations. The Brits say no. And so Mossadegh says, that's fine. The oil's in Iran. We'll nationalize the oil industry. It should work for Iranians anyway. That's going to set off a couple of years of court fights in the international court system. It's also going to spur a British economic boycott of Iran. What's important for our discussion today is what happens in 1953. Because the baggage that Mossadegh has is this association with the Tuda Party, which is a communist party. You can't be any shade of communist socialist and fit well with U.S. foreign policy. And so given the realities of the Cold War at the time, the Korean War is in its last stages in early 1953 as this is this coup that we're going to talk about is going on. But also you've got the occupation of Eastern Europe, the fall of China, the Soviets have a bomb by 1949, so it looks like communism's on the run. You can't allow something like this in an important geographic area like Iran, because it abuts the Soviet Union. It's also important for British economic interests, but less so for US economic interests. And so the United States and the British are gonna work with Iranian groups to force out Mossadegh. It's not the case that this is necessarily proof of Mossadegh's lack of popularity with Iranians. It's more that Mossadegh doesn't have the right people to support him. So he doesn't have the clerics on his side, doesn't necessarily have the intellectuals on his side, and the Shah is not the best option, but a better option. And so the Shah is gonna come into power more of his own. Before 1953, think in terms a little bit like a constitutional monarchy, not as we think of Britain today, but more as Britain was in the 18th, early 19th century. You have an empowered monarch, you have somewhat of a representative parliament that has some purview, but not much. What Mossadegh wants to do is expand that purview and take that power from the crown. What the Shah wants is to maximize that power 
from 53 to 63, he's going to have an informal political arrangement with power groups in Iran. There's not going to be a large political opposition. There's also not going to be a lot of political action in the way that we would understand it. But he does understand he needs stakeholders to support his reign or at least acquiesce to it. This is going to change in 63 with the White Revolution where he starts to modernize Iran. He wants to have a literacy campaign. He wants women to have the vote. He wants to make Iran look more modern, also more Western. He's going to do this with oil revenues, which are increasing at an incredible rate. The problem is this is going to alienate the intellectuals and the clerics because when we look at modernization, we're comfortable with that idea. But a lot of the more conservative elements in Iran see this as westernization and see this as selling out. They don't see this as the Shah acting on his own. They see this as evidence that the Shah is more of a puppet. So from 63 through 79, what you're going to see is more of authoritarian. He's a dictator in 53 to 63. 63 to 79, he's an authoritarian and oppressive dictator. This is only going to get worse with the oil crisis in 1973, where oil prices are gonna skyrocket, the Arab states embargo oil exports to the United States. But the Iranians are willing to sell, but not at a discount. They're gonna sell at a premium. So the Shah is not a client, necessarily. He has his own agenda. Brian talked about this idea of a Persian empire. What the Shah sees is he is a Persian nationalist. He wants to make Iran important. What the U.S. needs is more and more of a security force. This is especially true by the end of the 1960s. As Britain is removing itself from the region, the United States wants the Iranians to be that security force to help stop the encroachment of the Soviet Union. But we're not doing that for what's good for the Iranians. We're doing that for what's good for foreign policy and U.S. interest in the region. What the Iranians see is an increasingly oppressive government backed by a government that talks about inalienable civil liberties, that talks about the rights of individuals to have their own agency and choose their own future. That dissonance is really going to come to a head as we get to 1979 and the revolution that's going to take the Shah from power and then turn Iran into something that we know today. We talk about this idea of an about face. It comes as a surprise, but the more that we understand what's going on inside of Iran, the more the surprise of the revolution, you kind of wonder how much we should have been surprised for that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frank, and we'll see a little bit more about the impacts of the revolution. Okay. Thank you, Gates. And Brian, thank you for that, um, for the uh, review, the, the history of the empire, the Persian empire. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is, uh, these are the historians in the room. And they can, they can really give you the context, and they can really bring to life what the, uh, what the biggest pressures were on the policy guy. So I'm going to bring you up to speed on kind of where we're at. Because we really aren't going to know what's going on now until we read about it in books 50 years from now. OK, so first of all, let me just ask, uh, first of all, say uh, thanks for everyone coming here tonight. This is great to see uh, this kind of participation with um, our community. Um, civil society is what makes America great, um, to have this dialogue and to learn about things. This is what's lacking in many places. So uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so let me just ask the room, who here, when you think of Iran, uh, who here has good thoughts? Oh, we have a few. And you with the Chicago hat. Thumbs up, by the way. I'm from Chicago. Um, OK, who here, when you think of Iran, nothing but bad thoughts come to mind? Okay, well, that's interesting. That was an equal distribution. Um, I would argue that to the average American who thinks about, at least who grew up in, you know, in, in my age, I'm 52, uh, and so 1979 was an amazing eye-opener, and I think it was for many of you as well. And today, um, I think when people think of Iran, they only think of the bad thoughts. And when, when that happens, uh, we look to the news. Recently, it's seizure of cargo ships and oil tankers in the Gulf supporting proxy groups. There's uh, some sort of uh, uh, issue with Israel, right? Uh, there's a nuclear program. It, and they constantly get labeled as the bad guy. Well, I'm not here to change your mind. 
but I'm here to give you a little bit more context about what's going on and where we're headed. Now, 1979 was a pivotal year. Uh, the revolutionary, the, the, the uh, Islamic Re Revolution bifurcates our relations with Iran. It's a clear cut. And for those of you who remember, it was uh, 444 days hostages from the embassy. Uh, and we couldn't forget that. Uh, and that uh, ultimately led to President Carter's defeat in the election and President Reagan uh, coming. Not, not exclusively, but that was certainly uh, it, you know, a, a main, that was one point in the election. Now, as, you know, if we went just a couple years back from that, who knew that we would wind up today supporting Saudi Arabia as a strong partner in the Middle East and turning our backs on Iran? Because as we're learning from the history, things aren't like they, things then weren't like they were now. I mean, we had a, two pillars of security in the Middle East, in the Gulf area. And so if you show your cards a little bit, you notice I'm saying Gulf. I'm not saying Persian Gulf, and I'm also not saying Arabian Gulf. And those of you who are Middle East watchers know that, that uh, people pay attention to that phrase, uh, that you know, which one it is that you're going to use. So I'll play it safe today. Now, the interesting thing I will tell you is uh, of that empire, that of the nations that most reflect the identity of Americans as educated people, as people in understanding government and uh, structure to be, uh, I look to Iran to actually be the country that reflects uh, the United, some of the, you know, a lot of the United States uh, more than Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that is not a political commentary, it is an observation. So please bear with me. Now, uh, Iran is a technological country. They administered a very large empire. Uh, the people are educated. Um, the, um, and to show that the, uh, the Mossadegh overthrow um, was uh, really a, a very complicated onion to peel. Oh, let me just get this going. There. For what we're looking at here, I want you to expand the scope. It's not just the, the Gulf. If you look to the other side, we've got Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan. You've got the Caucasus. Uh, this country right here doesn't try, the people, I mean, I don't just mean the government, but everyone, the people don't trust foreigners, and they have good reason to. They had constant, uh, uh, you know, within, within the, the, the modern age, it was constant interference from the Russians and from the British. Uh, was the tobacco concession, I think, uh, was one of the first big uh, uh, problems uh, with um, the previous dynasty, Ad, you know, administering, getting, getting more money for the empire to be able to support the lifestyle of the Shah. Well, that, that eventually changes as we, we look as the oil economy develops. Well, now we can sell the oil under our feet. Well, that's the oil curse, right? So let me go on. The uh, mustard attack overthrow uh, by the CIA was uh, in the reinstatement of the Shah to power tainted the popular view of the United States that we had had. And the great thing about the United States coming into the Middle East at that time was that we were sort of a neutral partner. We didn't have a colonial past. Um, we were looked at democratic light of freedom, uh, you know, and, uh, but mostly it was that we didn't have the same baggage that the UK and France and, and Russia did in this region. So that carried a lot of weight for a long time, but it wasn't forgotten after the 50s what we did, uh, what the CIA's uh, participation was. And so what did that mean? Well, uh, the, the conditions were set for the, uh, for the revolution. And so let me just take you a little bit further. The revolution looked like a lot of different things. And uh, the, at, the at the time, the, uh, who we know is uh, Khomeini, the, the, the Ayatollah who really launched the revolution, was one of the components of it. And there were a lot of movements at the time. There were the communists, there were the reformists, uh, and there were the, uh, the, the, the extremist uh, religious right. Uh, just as a, as a point of contention, the religious right did not support um, Mossadegh. You know, uh, and so the politics is, like I said, it's a very complicated onion to peel. Um, let me just uh, cut to the chase. The 19, uh, after 1979, they had to reinvent themselves and they had to make new friends. The, uh, I want to point out that the revolution uh, also caused a fear of instability throughout the Islamic world. 
the leaders of other Islamic countries sensed that this would be uh, a, a revolution, an international revolution. And that is what uh, the uh, Islamic Republic uh, of Iran, the leaders there, were hoping would happen, that it would be an international uh, sensation. But it was not driven, uh, as you can see what happened after that, there was not the communist, it was not the reformers, it was not the religious right even that survived. It was only the, the heart of the revolutionaries of Khomeini. And then what happens next? Uh, what happens next in the politics is uh, Saddam Hussein, the, the neighbor, uh, of course sees an opportunity and invades and begins the Iran-Iraq war, which lasts from 1980 to 1988. It was, it was a great opportunity because uh, the um, government was trying to figure itself out and build new infrastructure. Um, so they seized an opportunity. By 1982, uh, Iran had uh, consolidated its forces, had taken ground back, and uh, began a long stalemate. And it wasn't until uh, 1985 that I'll, I'll talk about some, some key points. Um, and uh, we have the, uh, the end of the war, which really um, was a deadlock in 1988. All right, the, the, the Israel, Islamic Republic of Iran stands as a significant component to regional stability in the Middle East. I will say that it is an important component. The government, uh, I'm here to tell you, acts as a rational actor to achieve its strategic goals and fulfill its grand strategy which is based on its history, culture, and geopolitical orientation. I'm not gonna tell you that they're crazy people running Iran. They're a rational actor. But it's based on a, a, a history that these gentlemen know well as historians. It's affecting their ethos, how they act. And the one uh, crystallizing event in that is the 1979 revolution. Um, it did not cause a worldwide uh, phenomena of Islamic takeover of, of illegitimate uh, uh, leaders like they were hoping. However, it did cause the Grand Mosque to be seized in uh, 1979 and instability in Pakistan. So I will point out it did have its gravity. Uh, most importantly, what we get wrong uh, when we talk about the Iranian, uh, Iranian regime's motivations are, and the first thing I would like to highlight, is that the Islamic Republic of Iran's identity is a revolutionary government. And that's the thing I don't think we really ever square up. It's mirror imaging. They are a revolutionary government and that carries through in nearly everything policy driven. It goes back to that revolution. This plays out in every maneuver. The second thing I would also like to point out um, is uh, that the, uh, about the Islamic Republic of Iran is that its leadership is neither Islamic nor is it a republic. It's historically Shia, but represents uh, Islam in a narrow way. And I, don't, and I think even narrower than, than Twelver. Uh, and I would say that in a way that they harness a revolutionary authoritarianism from a viewpoint that, of the supreme leader. And it's not a republic. Iran uses the facade of a representative government. Let me back up one. That's basically what the government looks like. It's got every tendril, every uh, office of, of a modern democracy. And, re, and you can see the Supreme Leader is, uh, is firmly at the top. However, the power structure is led by, uh, by the religious uh, authorities. Okay? So that's a more complicated uh, map. I'm not going to get into that. But I will go to this. That although there are elected positions within the government, it gives it that visage of legitimacy. Uh, really, even the Supreme Leader is voted in. It's not really like that. It's really controlled centrally. The other component of the government is going to be the, uh, the uh, IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which I can talk about uh, in more detail later, but I want to conclude my comments. Uh, the government itself, um, I would say it's, uh, it's, Iran uses a facade of government. This is, uh, I would say it's the Islamic government of Iran, uh, not a republic. In, uh, as reality goes, their government is largely incompetent because of the way they can manage the money or to administer their government. But the real power to, to run the country is the, R the IRGC. They are in every component of policy. They are in every component of the economy. They are the Mr. 10% taking everything 
out of industry, out of oil trades, out of everything. They run, the, the country runs because the IRGC runs it. Now, the last thing I'll conclude with uh, is uh, policy. Now, uh, the national security strategy of the United States, the latest one uh, produced by the Biden White House, uh, il illustrates a couple of key points about Iran, um, in, specifically in de-escalation and integration of the Middle East. Uh, it talks about a framework, a new framework building in the Middle East about the recent progress of the regional states. And you can see that this is sort of springboarding off of the Trump administration's um, uh, the um, uh, Abraham Accords to uh, recognize, uh, to normalize uh, relations with, uh, with Israel as a way of guaranteeing more uh, uh, security. What that shows is that uh, what they're saying is Iran's, they're, they're identifying Iran specifically. Iran's threats against the United States personnel as well as current and former U.S. officials will not be tolerated. As we have demonstrated, we will respond when our people and interests are attacked. As we do so, we'll always stand with the Iranian people, striving for the basic rights and dignity long denied by them in the regime of Tehran. So I will say that the Biden administration recognizes the complex nature of, I'm sorry about I'm jumping all over the slides, complex nature of Iran. This is the a religious breakdown of Iran right here. It is not just Shia. There are Sunni. There are uh, Jewish people. There are Zoroastrians. There are a small community of Christians. That's just what I'm saying. It's a, it's a country with a lot of different identities in it. People who want to be educated, people who want pride in their country as well. Make no mistake, uh, Iran is seeking to restore its rightful place in the Middle East as the strongest voice in Islam and to fulfill its seat at the table of respected nations. And it cannot do it right now with the atmosphere of distrust with the United Nations, with the United States, um, with all international partners. Um, and I will uh, reflect on more of these uh, observations later in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so it is now your time. So we're going to entertain questions. Uh, you're welcome to come up to the mic. So I am going to force you to come up to the mic. That's my instruction. And then we will take your questions and direct them as appropriate. Here's the one mic here, the other one's there in front, and you don't want to cross, cross Brian. Yeah, that's right. No, I, I'm working for Leslie right now, and, and she has directed me, you must use the mics, so. Yes, sir, I'm, I'm always curious about the relationship between the, the military of, our military and the military of our potential adversaries. Do you know if there's any contact at all between our military and the Iranian military? Is okay. there any informal back channel meetings, arrangements, what, what have you, anything like that? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to pass it off to Frank, but I will make one comment. For, for years, and I don't know if it's still the case, it was illegal for any U.S. military person to have any contact with an Iranian military person. So I had a friend who was uh, an attache in Sana'a, Yemen, and he was walking out of the Yemeni uh, Ministry of Defense at the time that, and this was in the, would have been late 90s, maybe early 2000s, and he was walking out as the Iranian uh, military attache was walking in and so he was like going down the steps and he was coming up the steps. And the fact that they said hello to each other, he had to report that. Yeah. And like he was chastised for the fact that like, why didn't you basically hide yourself behind a pillar and act like you didn't see him? So that was how crazy it was then. I don't know if that's changed. Frank, do you have a... So uh, I'll tell you that uh, it's now harder than ever. Uh, the, the quick answer is no. It's not like we have uh, a, a hotline like we do with the, uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has a counterpart with the, uh, uh, with the, with the Republic of, uh, People's Republic of China uh, Army. Uh, that does not exist. And uh, there's a couple of complicated reasons for that now. Uh, we'll say that there is a diplomatic, there's always been a diplomatic channel open through other embassies. And this is how we've always communicated with them. Um, the Swiss embassy gets you know, pointed to a lot is that's, that's where it all happens. It, honestly, it happens in every embassy. 
And so uh, uh, my short tour in working at embassy, uh, what I realized is that uh, embassies in other countries can uh, have uh, age, you know, uh, diplomatic staff that speak to, to each other and talk about things. And that will get back to the, home, the host nation. I'm not saying that those conversations happen in any way, but I will tell you that there is an avenue for it. Now, the part that makes it even harder now is the uh, IRGC is the main component of the military. Now, there is a chairman, there's a joint uh, leader of the, um, what we call the Artesh, which is the, uh, the regular army and our Air Force and Navy of Iran. Uh, however, uh, the IRGC leadership runs that. And since 2019, President Trump has made the IRGC a terrorist, a foreign terrorist organization. So therefore, any official communications would be absolutely prohibited. So um, I'm not sure exactly how far our direct communication would go between military leaders. Um, because uh, as you can see what's happening between ships in the Gulf right now, there, there really are no, no rules. I don't really understand how, at this point, we would we would get from here to there without a lot of diplomatic uh, work ahead of it. And I just want to help everybody because we've thrown around some terms. Okay, uh, so Frank explained IRGC is Islamic. It's not Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. They exist to protect the revolution. Okay, now you could see that as the regime in power. The Iranian Army, Navy, Air Force, insofar as that exists, they exist to protect Iran. Okay, so they have a dual military. A lot of countries in the Middle East have dual militaries. They'll have a regime protection military. But in this case, it's not a regime protection. It's a revolutionary protection. And that's what the IRGC exists. So that's why you have this duplicate structure. Uh, but they're not the only guys who have that. But they, they definitely do. Yes, sir. Oh, you can ask her. Oh, OK. OK. I had a quick question about your thoughts on the emerging influence of China recently brokering diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. If we were caught off guard and do you see the U.S. role diminishing in that region and China filling that power vacuum? Okay, that is a great question. So it is now a good opportunity for me to say, particularly Gates and I, are speaking our personal opinions and not policy <laughs> positions of the United States government, just so everybody hears that clearly. Okay, um, so it was interesting. When, when this went down, I was teaching electives at uh, the Commander General Staff College. And I normally have, because uh, I teach Middle East history electives, and I get lots of Middle East officers. Uh, I think they think it's an easy A. Anyway, uh, but I get lots of them, and it's sort of fun. So I jokingly refer to them as the Arab League, because I have like five of them, all from different countries. And I asked them that question, because I had my opinion and uh, sometimes Arabs can be rather cynical as a group. Uh, they have a great sarcastic sense of humor, which is why I like working with them so much. But, um, but sometimes they can be cynical. And I expected them to be really cynical, because I was very cynical about it. And I was surprised. Every one of them, and I had a, I had a, a Saudi, I can't remember the different countries, but I think Saudi, Kuwaiti. But it was like all around the Gulf area. And, and they actually were quite a bit more upbeat in the sense that they thought it was a necessary move. Uh, they all sort of blamed the US, what they, what they perceived, that like this wasn't my words, that was sort of their characterization, the US departure from the region. And it made sense in their minds that somebody would step in and that China would seem to be somebody who could balance that. And I, I was surprised. Because I thought that they would, wow, oh, they're just doing this, and, and Iran's not going to uphold any agreement or whatever. But they kind of thought that Iran was going to hold up their end. But anyway, I, I just thought that was an interesting observation. And it, and it taught me yet again, I, I don't know, I probably I should have learned this years and years ago, that the region regularly surprises me. So, But Frank, I, I expect you have some thoughts on that. So uh, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, first, uh, I think it's. Uh, it's a canny move. Uh, I, I think that uh, China would like to appear uh, to be a broker of peace and friendship. Uh, but, what, and, but I will tell you that China does not look to replace 
uh, what the United States was in the Gulf. It's too expensive. We can't, uh, I mean, we can't even do it, you know, honestly, for, to, to support all of it. So uh, I think that it represents an opportunity for China. Uh, it, uh, Saudi Arabia, now let's take a step back now. It's been a couple of months since that happened. Um, let's take a step back and see what's happened with that relationship directly between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I would tell you not much. And so it's been a lot of um, uh, public grandstanding. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. So there you go. Great. Now to the gallant gentleman here. Oh, hi. She took part of my question away, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, was also, I was also happy that you gave a balanced view of Iran. But my question is, is about Saudi Arabia. And the 9-11 attackers were from Saudi Arabia. We had the Khashoggi killing in Istanbul. We have the uh, Saudis supporting, or basically they're, they're, just, they're just terrorizing Yemen. And, uh, and yet we still ally ourselves with Saudi Arabia. And also about terrorism, I wanted to say that when we think about terrorism, you know, you think about Hamas or ISIS, and those are Sunni, they're not Shia. So I would like your comments on that. Okay, just as a reminder, <laughs> speaking for the United States government. Okay, um, that's, a, that's a good question because it, I would suggest, I'm debating how unpopular I'm going to be. Um, it's, I, like, I have a lot of Saudi students that I interact with, and I've interacted with a lot of them. I, I think we give, as we do with Iran, I think we give Saudi Arabia a bad rap. And uh, I could express what I think is the second stupidest decision of the 20th century, but I'm not going to say that uh, because we're being recorded. But, <laughs> but so I'm not necessarily a fan but I also think we need to keep our relationship with Saudi Arabia in perspective, okay? Uh, we interact with a lot of not pure players around the world. Uh, they are definitely one of them. They are the only country in the world who can increase the flow of oil by simply turning a spigot. The only one. Everybody else produces at or very, very close to capacity. Saudi Arabia has millions of barrels of excess capacity. The only country in the world. You don't, like, who said that famous line, like, you don't want to pick a fight with somebody who buys ink in barrels? And you shouldn't pick a fight with a country that is the one that controls the most important energy commodity on the planet right now until we figure out how to do something else. So I, I think often we, we write them off. Yes, the 9-11 tactics came from there, but you could have made the same argument, and oh, by the way, the British government did, that a whole lot of IRA money and weapons came from Boston. Now, did that make us terrorists? as I had a close friend growing up whose dad regularly traveled back. His last name was Ryan, by the way, and he regularly traveled to, uh, to Ireland every year, and he wasn't doing it just to see the green fields. And, and you know, we had our theories of what he was doing, but the simple point was, like, I, I just say keep them in perspective. Uh, the Saudis are a fascinating and a complex country, and I don't think any simple explanation is fair. Uh, but I would also agree that most criticism is accurate. <laughs> so uh, I'm not saying that they're a good player, but they are a player, and we need to have a relationship with them. And it is in our interest to have that be a positive relationship. Now, I would have preferred us to figure out a way to have a positive relationship with Iran um, as well. So to me, this isn't an either-or thing. Uh, I don't know that we've run the Iranian relationship correct at all. I don't know. Do you have thoughts on Saudi? Uh, so Saudi is interesting. Um, if, you, if you look at the Saudi monarchy, 
it's actually on a trajectory of being more liberal than the, than the people who live there. And, uh, the, and this is probably a more of a, an identity of being a, a, a royal or a monarchy. I don't know that for sure. But I will tell you that the way you balance this, they, to gate legitimacy, they always had to uh, provide special favors with the religious community, the ulama, the, uh, the, the scholars. So it was a mutual uh, relationship, a, a symbiont circle even, that uh, they recognized the authority of the monarchy and the monarchy uh, uh, allowed the uh, religious uh, community to sort of run its affairs within guidelines, put it that way. Um, and so that has led to a lot of tensions. And if you look at either the bombing of Kobar Towers, you look at uh, the, um, the Islamic schools that were, you know, uh, giving, uh, you know, extreme, you know, extreme, uh, extremist views uh, in their books and, and so forth, that is, uh, that is not by whole from the recognized uh, uh, Saudi government. Um, that is really just uh, kind of the civil society of Saudi Arabia creeping out thanks to all the petrodollars that we fed them in the 70s, by the way. Um, so I, I, I think that that's, a, that's another complicated issue. But as a, as a mono, as a, they're definitely not a um, uh, singular mono, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, a singular society, a homogenous society. There's definitely a lot of different views. So you're, you're going to see some of that opposition. Brian, let's go here. And then I'm going to get a couple of questions in okay. from uh, online. Do you want to go first? You're on. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I was a janitor at the Staff and Command College back from 72 to 74, and they usually had three war games back then, Middle East, Eastern Europe, and Far East, you know, uh, Korea, China, Japan. And uh, I just... Uh, when I'm looking at this map, it's, you know, uh, we had a lot of uh, Iraqi and Iranian students at the staff college back then. And, you know, when the revolution happened, all of a sudden we took up with Iraq. <laughs> and my second question is that what did hash and poppies have to do with anything back in those times with the drug trade, which was really getting kicked off after Vietnam? And the third question is, are we going to be able to put any puppets in uh, Iraq or Iran? Wait, say that last one again? Will we be able to put any puppets in Iraq or Iran to uh, do what we want them to do? <laughs> Okay, so uh, one of my uh, issues with referring to groups as puppets in the region, at least my experience in working with Arabs, Arabs are not good puppets. So I don't know that that sort of scenario, and the Iranians often struggle with this as well, like they're plus one groups, like they often do what they want because their interests are aligned, but when their interests aren't aligned, it's not like those groups are puppeted into exactly what they're supposed to do. But I'm, I'm going to let Gates talk about drugs. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Uh, you know, as far as driving policy or things of that nature, with respect with Iran, not to my knowledge, yeah, I, I haven't heard that. Um, I would reiterate with the idea of puppets, you know, the Shah if the Iranians thought he was a puppet, he didn't stay bought when Nixon asked him to sell yeah. oil at a discount. And he says, no, you're going to pay four times a going rate. So that, that's the tension, right? We Sometimes we have a reductivist view of these leaders. And a lot of that is just because we need a, a nice, convenient narrative to understand it. But oftentimes, it's a lot more complicated than we give it credit for at first pass. I, I, I do want to say, in, in support of that comment, like. I, I, okay, so this audience remembers Tip O'Neill. Okay, when I tell my students Tip O'Neill, I have to explain who he was and all this <laughs> other stuff. So you guys know Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill is famous for uh, the statement, and he's not the originator of it, but that all politics are local, right? Okay, all foreign policy is domestic. Mm -hmm. 
The sooner everybody just buys that, like to understand why countries do what they do external to their country, you have to understand what they do or why they do it internal to their country because that's what drives their interactions, just as it does with the United States. Uh, and so the reason why a country does isn't because we're puppeting them or somebody else's. It's often because it's what's in the interest of that domestic market uh, or audience. <laughs> Sir. Two questions from our online audience, and then we'll get you, and then we'll call it an evening, okay? Um, do you believe the Ayatollahs, when they write about using nuclear weapons to bring Armageddon, or would there be too much pushback within the country to do so? I'll let you start with that one, Frank. So they say that uh, a good question is one you have an answer for, and a great <laughs> question is one you have a slide for. And that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> So uh, now this question about nuclear weapons is, is uh, troublesome, right? What do we do with them? The best part about nuclear weapons is not using them. <clears throat> and that seems to be the lesson that a lot of countries are learning from the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that it's given Russia a lot more leverage in things than they probably would have been able to. It's been the threat of nuclear weapons, just the threat alone. And conversely, it's allowed the United States to have leverage in, in areas as well. I won't discount that. However, this is what they see. This is the regime's, it's an entitlement under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and a point of national pride by Iranian leaders and the majority of uh, Iran's population. Okay, it's an inalienable and refutable right to enrich. So remember how I was talking about the Iranian people? Okay, in 1985, they figured out in the Iran-Iraq war that they needed to develop their own weapons program because the Shah had bought all these other weapons programs or weapons systems from all these other countries. Well, that was shut off. They figured out they had to do it themselves. By the 90s, they had a vibrant, self, uh, a fully Iranian weapons system. And today, they are manufacturing weapons to, for Russia. Now, tell me that isn't you know, learning your lessons. Now, what about this whole thing? So the, the bottom line is this. If you were in our position, right, we have nuclear weapons, we're the good guys. We always do everything for, for the, the freedom and democracy for everyone. But, you know, uh, you know, if the tables were turned, you know, wouldn't that make you nervous and wouldn't you want to buy some kind of insurance? So what they're saying is, wait a minute, we want this for our own security as well. And I think that the, that the, uh, the questioner online is correct. Well, wait a minute that uh, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't we do something about that? Uh, th now we're getting into a real problem because it's that threshold. Once they get the weapon, now it allows them to negotiate in a different way <coughs> versus now we're, it, it's semantic. You know, we, we want to eliminate the program. Did I answer the question? I believe so. Okay, all right. Well, uh, yeah, the second part of the question was would there, if, if, if they indeed believed in going that, the Ayatollahs believed in going that direction, would the country, would the populace uh, support them in that role? So the question there, is a strategy. The question I always ask as a strategist is in order to do what? In order to do what? What is that nuclear weapon going to do? I don't think that they would use it. And I would say right now, there's a greater threat from Iran through their proxy groups, through using religion as a weapon, through their associations with Hezbollah in Lebanon, through uh, Bashar al-Assad in uh, Syria. There's a greater threat in that alone than there is in nuclear weapons as, a, as, a, as an actual kinetic weapon. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And the second one, we'll get to you right after this. Did the U.S. miss an opportunity in 2012 during the uh, Iranian uh, citizens' uprising against religious leadership? You're standing already. Yeah. Go, I'm standing. go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more time, please. Did the U.S. miss an opportunity in 2012 during the Iranian citizens' uprising against the religious leadership? Okay, so um, I will say that whatever, whatever color revolution, whatever movement, and even the most recent one with the instability with Mas Masamini, uh, the um, Iranian regime is, is resilient. Um, the, the cult of personality is the Ayatollah, um, the, the supreme leader, but the power structure that keeps him in place is the IRGC, and so just taking out that one person isn't going to do it. And the IRGC is subservient to the supreme leader, but I wouldn't say to, to a fault. I would say that there's definitely a power structure there. I don't think that any, at this point, even after looking at the most recent 
uh, riots and uprisings, for the months long they were, as intense as they were, I actually think that the regime is more robust than, uh, than I think we in the West uh, uh, give it credit for. So I don't think it's a matter of, uh, I think even if we put, that the problem is, I think uh, President Obama saw this, is that he put more, it was perceived that he put more pressure on um, the, the protesters or the revolutionaries, or counter-revolutionaries, I guess. Um, and as a result, he backed off in any further interference in um, Iranian politics. And then we, and then well, Trump came in with maximum pressure, but that was something completely different. So um, uh, I think that the other part is pride. It's pride of the empire. Uh, the average Iranian does not like the IRGC, but if it's foreign influence, if it's the United States putting sanctions on the IRGC, if it's the UK who has just named the IRGC as a terrorist, foreign terrorist organization, well then you know what? The Iranians will rally behind the IRGC as a matter of that's our national pride. When you, when you corner somebody, you're leaving them very few options to choose. And so um, I think, I don't think there's anything right now that we can do to change that, 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 that the denseness of the, the regime right now. Um, if I could, yeah, go ahead. so I think you also raised a good point when you asked to what end. You know, there's, there's an idea or an implication in that question that you put more pressure than you know what the outcome's going to be. But even at the beginning of the revolution in 1979, there are groups inside who are participating in the revolution who think that it's going to turn out in a way that's wildly different from how it actually turns out. And so if you're on the ground fighting in the revolution thinking you know which way it's going to go and you're completely wrong, how can the U.S. operating far outside have any real indication of where that's going to go? And so the idea that somehow there's a right set of policy moves or incentives or disincentives that can cause something as unstable and chaotic as a revolution to play out the way we expect it to, the revolution in 79 that we talked about should be proof against that. Thanks for your patience, sir. You've got the final question. <laughs> um, how is the relationship between the uh, United States and Israel affected by Iran's uh, movement to acquire uh, nuclear weapons? Okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. As I'm trying to think through, one, one of the elements is, uh, okay, so when I worked in Israel, one of the observations was the Israelis are, like, if you look at the U.S. government like a semi-truck, like, it takes us a long time to get rolling to speed, but, but once we get moving, we bring a lot, like, like more than any other country, but, but we're not very fast and nimble. The Israelis are more like a sports car, so they can, they can get moving fast, and they can get in a direction. They don't bring a lot, but, but they can go and they can turn rapidly. And so the analogy that we that used, and this is now 10, 15 years ago, but was that Israel wanted to get America running toward a cliff as fast as possible, knowing that it could hit the brakes and stop, and then America would sail off that cliff like Optimus Prime going into the Grand Canyon, <laughs> right? That's a Transformers reference. Well, um, like, film, like film and Louise. Maybe may, may bad uh, reference. So... Uh, and, and I think that there is a certain element of how Israel tries to play this, is they want to get American policy amped up so that, because the Israelis do not want to have to actually do it, whatever it is. So if it is bombing their sites, they don't want to, because if you look at what it would take for the Israeli Air Force to actually do anything effective, they would have to do multiple turns uh, flying with tankers or refueling in countries that aren't big fans. Like, that, like, there's a lot of work it would take for the Israeli military to pull it off. So from their perspective, way better if we do it. So that's their objective, I think, in so much of their rhetoric is, is to encourage our action against uh, them. Uh, which I think, in their mind, is in Israel's interest. The, the key challenge is trying to understand what is in America's interest, and is it actually in our, in our interest to bomb Iran?
contrary to the songs of the 1979 and 1980. So if you're familiar with that one. I don't know, Frank, do you have a thought on it? Uh, all I'll or? say is uh, if there are um, you know, coordinations between the United States and Israel on curbing uh, Iran's nuclear program by uh, airstrikes or any other kinetic means, we're certainly not hearing about it in the open press. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and anything Israel does is, is disavowed as being uniquely Israeli, as far as I, I know. That's, that's where I'll leave it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank all of you for being here and for the great questions. <laughs>